So, today I'm going to talk to you about disorders of sexual development, or DSD as it's sometimes referred to. And DSD encompasses a wide range of conditions which can affect on a person's sexual development. And I have an interest in the subject because of working in the endocrine team in paediatrics, and it's often children who present with ambiguous genitalia that are, we're the ones that are first see these children and have to deal with them. I first really had an interest or started to sort of get an understanding of this when I was uh, attending a paediatric endocrine conference in Milan and I saw these people protesting outside the conference hall and at first I thought they were talking about female genital mutilation and just raising awareness but it soon became apparent that actually they were protesting against uh, sur- about to us healthcare professionals and how and surgical correction of children with uh, disorders of sexual development and there's a lot of controversy surrounding how these children should be treated and whether we should actually do anything at all. The, hopefully through my talk I'm going to talk about some of the issues and the controversies around DSD and the treatment and help build understanding and help you make, raise awareness so that you can have a better understanding of the processes that go on and hopefully help you see past some of the more sensational Daily Mail headlines that sometimes get produced. First of all, I'd like you just to have a think about how do you define sex? Do you see it as what someone looks like? Is it what their chromosomes are like? Or is it what they feel like? And I hope by the end of my talk that I'm going to try and persuade you that we should rather consider it's what someone feels like is how we should define their sex, rather than their chromosomes or what they look like. First of all, I'm going to start with a story about how we define people's gender and whether it's nature or nurture. Is, is our gender identity something that we're born with or is it something that just happens as we have sort of conformed to social norms? The story starts with two identical boys. And they, these boys were having problems urinating, so their parents took them along to see their local doctor and the doctor diagnosed them as having phimosis and referred them on to a paediatric urologist. And the urologist decided the best thing to do for them would be for them to be circumcised. And he decided to do a slightly controversial technique of circumcision using cauterisation. And unfortunately, it went wrong with the first twin, Brian, and actually ended up burning off his penis. Understandably, the parents then refused for him to do the second twin. And that twin actually went on and without any surgical correction, and the phimosis um, corrected itself. The parents were obviously very concerned about how Brian would, would grow up without a normal penis, and they made contact with this doctor, Dr. Money, who at the time was well known for his ideas on sexual identity and sexual development. Dr. Money strongly believed that our gender is more to do with how we see ourselves physically. So if you see yourself as a boy and you're raised as a boy, then you're going to develop as a boy. And he convinced the parents that the best thing to do for Brian would be to surgically correct him and make him female and give him female hormones. So over the next few years, the twins were followed up by Dr. Manny and it appeared that the sexual reassignment had been a great success, with the parents reporting that Brian, who was now called Brenda, was behaving as a normal girl. Money reported this case as the John and Joyce case, which a few of you may be aware of, and it became a leading example of how gender identity is more about how your appearance and your upbringing. And everyone thought this was the perfect case, because you had identical twins, so perfect case controlled, with one of them being raised as a boy, one of them being raised as a girl, and yet genetically identical. And he seemed to show that it's all to do with your upbringing. However, things were not as the parents were reporting. Brenda was having gender identity issues, but he behaved, Brenda behaved more like a boy and was ostracised by his peers. At the age of 13, suffering from suicidal depression, the psychologist recommended to the family that they admit to him what had happened. By the age of 14, Brenda had started living as a boy and renamed himself David. And he started replacing the female hormones with male hormones and underwent male reassignment surgery. David was discovered by this chap, Dr. Milton Diamond, who found out that David was now living as a a boy and a man at this stage. 
and got permission for him to report the case and therefore disprove money's theory. David went on to publicise his own fate in order to prevent similar children undergoing the same process. Unfortunately, David continued to suffer from uh, depression and unfortunately committed suicide in 2004 at the age of 38. It's now widely accepted that your gender identity is something that you're born with. And our gender identity and sexual preferences are more strongly influenced by the processes before birth than then what happens after birth. So I'm now going to go back and look at what, what happens at that development and what makes us male or female. As you're probably aware, we all start off exactly the same with the potential to be able to differentiate into either sex. So I'm now going to try and demonstrate this. And being a paediatrician, I'm going to do it with the aid of balloons. So if you bear with me, if this is your malarian system, which will develop into a set of fallopian tubes, uterus and vagina, and the blue being the malarian system, which differentiates into your vas deferens, semicolon vesicles, and also your prostate. So what I'm going to start with is in the, what we'll call the default position. So in the female, where there's no, the, the gonads become ovaries, and there's no secretion of any testosterone. So what happens in that system is, first of all, now, we might lose a gonad at this point. The Wolfian system disappears, or regresses. We then get formation of the fallopian tubes for the malarian system developing into the your gonads, which are now ovaries, your fallopian tubes, your, your, your uterus, and the upper third of your vagina. And that's how the females develop. I've destroyed the Wolfian system, so I'm not going to demonstrate a male and make a big male phallus thing, but we'll talk through it. So in the male situation, what happens is, on your Y chromosome for males, you have your SRY gene, and it's your SRY gene that causes your gonads to differentiate into a testy. And in your testes, you then have your Sortoli cells and your Leydig cells. And the Sortoli cells secrete anti-malarian hormone, or AMH. So that causes a regression of the malarian system. Your Leydig cells then produce testosterone. It's the production of testosterone that causes the growth of the seminal vesicles and vas deferens. And that testosterone then gets further converted by 5-alpha reductase into dihydrotestosterone. And that causes the formation of the external male genitalia. So you get fusion of the labial folds into a scrotum and growth of the phallus from a clitoris into a penis. So understand it's clear that the process of the presence of hormones or lack of hormones can cause a difference in the appearance of your genitalia. And understanding this process is key to understanding how this can then obviously go wrong. Most of you are probably familiar with this diagram going back to physiology and things, but mind you, so I don't expect you to know this too much, but basically cholesterol up here, and that gets converted by a number of different pathways into a number of different hormones with your sort of corticosterone, cortisol being over here, and down the bottom, being testosterone. And any problems with this pathway can obviously lead to problems with the production of, uh, of hormones. And the most common problem is the 21-hydroxylase deficiency. So deficiency in 21-hydroxylase means that you're unable to produce your corticosterones and thereby default you get an overproduction of your androgens and testosterones down here. Remembering what I've already said about fetal development... If you have an overproduction of, a production of testosterone, then you get fusion of your label, the scrotal fold, and growth of phallus. So that it's not understanding that, that in a female who has congenital gene hyperplasia, an overproduction of these angels could, means that they have a conversion into male-looking genitalia. So these are pictures of two girls with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And as you can see from the diagram, they have varying degrees of virilization. And we sometimes, in endocrine, we use this thing called the Prada scale, and this shows the degree with normal female anatomy and male anatomy being at the bottom. And you can have a great variation between this. And you can, the congenital genital hyperplasias appear anywhere along this sort of spectrum. 
What's important to remember is that girls affected with congenital adrenal hyperplasia still have a normal internal female anatomy with ovaries and fallopian tubes and a uterus. The salt-wasting form of congenital adrenal hyperplasia is a serious medical emergency and it's really important to identify these children. Those children quite often present very soon. Um, those with the non-salt-weighting form may present later, and because of the problems with cortisol production, may present in, a, in crisis. Identifying these children can be a challenge, particularly in the very virilised uh, female, and therefore it's important to investigate all children with amb ambiguous genitalia, even those children that look phenotypically very male but have under absent testes. CH children are usually assigned according to their chromosomes. So once, normally if you have a child with ambiguous genitalia, one of the first things you're doing is, is checking their chromosomes. And those girls are identified as XX, but being very virilized, in most cases are brought up as males, uh, so as females. And that seems to suit most of them with 95% of girls who are being raised as girls happy with that sexual assignment. However, there is controversy over what should happen from a surgical point of view if there's no functional problem. So if the girl is able to pass urine, the argument is that we shouldn't really be doing anything. And many girls at present undergo operation to reduce the size of their clitoris or cause formation of a lower vagina, which must be kept open with regular dilatation. There are those that argue that any non-essential surgery should be delayed until later on when the girl herself can make the decision about what she wants done. Obviously, the parents and the child need a lot of support during their growth and development, and close relationship with psychology is very helpful. As long as girls are compliant with their medication, their androgen levels can be kept under control, and many of them can maintain their fertility and go on to have children. Some of you may be aware of this book, Middlesex, which is the Pulitzer-winning book by Jeffrey Eugenides. And this book uh, describes intersex condition, and the main character has a condition called 5-alpha reductase deficiency. So this is this enzyme down here. It means that they are unable to produce the dihydrotestosterone. So children with this condition, therefore, don't undergo the final androgenization. So they therefore have testes, an internal sort of male genitalia, but externally they look female. Most of these children uh, tend to be raised as females, but can often have uh, uh, problems with gender identity in the future. Another condition that leads to sexual development is complete androgen insensitivity. And this is when the body is producing the correct levels of hormones, but the body is insensitive to them. Incomplete androgen insensitivity syndrome, the person is XY but has, and has a functioning SRI gene but, and so therefore develops testes but then goes on to develop female genitalia. These individuals often appear as female and are often only diagnosed after investigation for primary, primary amenorrhea. Physically, they are very similar to females that have malarian agenesis or Rokotansky syndrome, and that's a condition where there's a failure of the malarian system to develop. And they therefore have normal external genitalia, but have a blind end of vagina with an absent uterus and fallopian tubes. Some individuals have partial androgen insensitivity, and as the name suggests, they have varying degrees of androgenization. The degree to which an individual is virilized, like in CH, can be very variable. Now, this person is called Tony Briffer, and he, he has partial androgen insensitivity. And he was the first major intersex political figure, becoming mayor of Hobson Bay in Australia. Now, Briffer was raised as a girl and then transitioned as being a male during adolescence. And he now no longer defines himself as being either male or female. And in fact, on his birth certificate in Australia, it's not defined whether he's a male or female. Research is limited into how, these, how we should treat these people with these conditions because obviously studies that have gone on are invariably small. There was this study by Diamond et al. which then looked at a number of different uh, of these conditions. And with complete androgen ins insensitivity, most of these people are raised as girls and are happy and see themselves as being as girls. That said, they still obviously have lots of 
there's an increased uh, incidence of depression and uh, psychological issues. It then becomes even more tricky when you start talking about partial androgen insensitivity because there's a wide range of how virilized these individuals will be and the gender to which they assign is a lot more tricky and that these ones are really difficult to give advice to the families over which, which way the child should be brought up and often as the case it depends on how virilized they are in infancy it depends on what dictates which way we advise the parents to go. All the cases so far I've talked about have just been related to problems with hormone production and the effect that the insect's conditions can be caused by problems actually with your sex chromosomes. So I've already, already said the SRY gene is located on your Y chromosome and, is it, and it's this that dictates what your gonads differentiate into, whether you develop testes or the absence of the SRI gene, you develop ovaries. Problems can occur if there's a translocation of this gene onto the X chromosome. So in this condition, this will lead to a person with XX chromosomes developing phenotypically and physically appearing as a male and an XY person developing as a female. These people have normal external genitalia and often are only detected in later life when they have problems with fertility and are further investigated in fertility clinics. This is Linda Hunt, who's an Oscar-winning Hollywood actress who a lot of you recognise, probably best known for her role nowadays in NCIS. Does anyone know what condition she has? Yes. It's not obvious. So she has Turner syndrome. It's obviously doesn't, it's not phenotypically typical of the, the, the Turners. And it, again, there's a variation in how Turners appear. But Turner syndrome is a condition where you only have a single X chromosome. Now, about 50% of Turner's people just have a single X, but the other 50% are a mosaic, and that means a proportion of their cells have X, and the other portion of their cells are XX. Turner's patients are nearly always female, but that, there are exceptions. And I'd like you to introduce the two patients who I've seen. So I'm going to call this Peter and Jane, and Peter and Jane are mosaic Turner's, and they have 55% X in their cells and, 50, and 45% XY in their other cells. Jane is very much a girl and Peter very much a boy and yet if you look at their chromosomes they are virtually identical in their proportion of X and Y. Yet having a Y chromosome does not make Jane a boy any more than having an X chromosome makes Peter a girl. As these cases demonstrate, sex chromosomes cannot be used solely to classify someone's gender. Now, while Turner's, condi Turner's is a condition where there's a loss of an X chromosome or Y chromosome, there can be conditions where you obviously get extra sex chromosome or material. So this is Kleinfelter's, and this is the most common sex chromosome disorder affecting approximately 1 in 600 births. Now, while we learn about the typical appearance of Kleinfelters, they tend to be a bit more feminized, less, less masculinized than a typical male, not all Kleinfelters meet uh, this, this phenotype because we know only about 10% of Kleinfelters are diagnosed in children. And out of the whole population, only 25% actually get diagnosed. So 75% of Kleinfelters never get a diagnosis. Now, while the majority of them identify as being male, we know that there is an increased association with, den with gender identity issues. And this is also found with other conditions where there's an increase in sex chromosomes. This is Caroline Cozy, and she's got triple XY. She was born a male and has a male phenotype, but later in life underwent gender reassignment and became a successful female model. She was the first transsexual to be a Bond girl and appear in Playboy. Cases of androgen and sensitivity... SRY translocation and Turner mosaics demonstrate how having a Y chromosome does not necessarily mean that you're male. This leads on to thinking about what does actually having a Y chromosome mean. A lot of unintended harm happens when people assume having a Y chromosome makes you a male and a lack of a Y chromosome makes you a female. It is true that in typical development the SRY gene on the tip of the Y chromosome will dictate whether you develop into a male or female. But hopefully, as I've shown, it's more than the SRY gene is needed in order for you to fully develop as a male or determine whether you become a female. In, as already discussed, with complete androgen insensitivity, these people have an SRY gene but lack the androgen receptors. And in terms of hormone effects on the body, including the brain, 
they have less androgenization than normal female XXs who will actually get androgenized to a small extent. So while I've talked about how genes and talked about how genes and hormones affect genital development, there's obviously also an effect on how these hormones affect the brain and how our brain develops. And these hormones will influence how our gender, our gender identity and our sexual orientation. And it's crucial in understanding this brain development is understanding of how we identify as a male or female. It's recognised that there are differences in how the male and females develop and how our sexual identity is created. Mouse studies have shown clear developmental differences between males and females. And as you can see from the slide, there are some areas of the male brain that are more developed than the female and some areas of the female brain, certain structures that are more developed than the male. And this even goes down to the cellular level. So if you look at some of these cells, if you look at the, these are neurons which are in the, uh, the preoptic nucleus in the, in the male, and they have an increase in twice as many dendritic spines as females. And this increase in dendritic spines means an increase in synapses. And this increase in synapses correlates with copulatory behaviour in, fe- in, in the male mice. W- while some of these changes are dictated by circulating androgens, we know that cannot be the complete case. Because if this was all to do with you having an increase in androgen production, then girls with congenital and adrenal hyperplasia would all associate as being, would all identify as being males. Yet I've already shown that 95% of those girls identify as being females. So there's something more going on than just simple androgen production. The processes dictating brain development are complex and multifactorial. And just in the same way as I've been talking about how your genitals can develop and there can be a scale between them being female down to male, I'd like you to think about that probably in the, in the same way when the brain develops, we can have a, the same sort of scale with people having a very male brain and a female brain and then there's the people in between. The difficulty for us as a side is when we should intervene and when gender reassignment should reoccur. It is more, it's more challenging to reassign these people after pu- puberty, but controversy remains about when to treat and start gender reassignment. Obviously, it's, it's perfectly normal for people to, during their development to question their sexuality and their gender. But I don't think that should stop us from intervening at an early stage. Most of these people who are truly transgender have always felt that they are in the wrong sex, and it's not a part not a simple phase that they are going through. And if you speak to parents of these children, they will always say they always thought they were this sex and there's never been any change. And by intervening in children, we we know that the earlier we intervene with surgery in these cases, the better outcome the surgical surgical correction is and also the less chance there is of mental health issues and problems with suicide. Now... Gender identity is also completely separate from sexual orientation. And like gender identity, there is a, a range with people identifying as heterosexual, homosexual, and then in between. Some of you may have seen this slide before. And I think this really encompasses a lot of what I've been talking about in my talk. So you can have someone's biological sex, which refers to the anatomy. In the same way, you can, someone can appear male, some can appear female, and then you can have the intersex people in between. That is completely separate from someone's gender identity. So whether they are ma- identify as a man, as a woman, or being in between. And again, that is completely separate from how someone's sexual orientation and their gender expression. Although our understanding of intersex and transgender conditions has improved, there's still a lot of misconceptions, and our prejudice even among medical professionals. People do not choose to be transgender any more than someone chooses to have Turner's syndrome. A person's gender is not dictated by what they look like, and it's not dictated by their their chromosomes, but more about what a person feels like. And as medical professionals, we need to show understanding, compassion, and being able to see past the Daily Mail headlines.